I've practiced that entrance so many times before. <laughs> well, good, good morning, brethren. It's good to see all of you here. On the fourth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, it's hard to believe we're already right at the halfway point. I'd like to also welcome all of those who are watching the video via, via our hookup. Happy Feast of Tabernacles to, to you, too. I'd like to also thank Mr. Woodburn for the special music today. It's always wonderful to hear his voice in Houston. We've, we've heard his voice quite a bit, and it's always a, a nice blessing. My wife Martha and I have been really enjoying the feast here. This is a beautiful area. Uh, Houston's kind of flat, very muggy, very humid, and it's very nice to actually have some topography and hills to enjoy and it's just a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. Well, brethren, God the Father and Jesus Christ have given us a great honor and privilege to be called and to be chosen by the Father to know and understand the precious truths about the Sabbath, about the holy days, about the wonderful plan of salvation, about our incredible future, about the incredible potential and the future of all mankind, about the identity of God the Father and of Jesus Christ in the record of Scripture, and about our responsibilities in pursuing God the Father's will. During the past many years, and recently during the past few months, many people have asked me if brethren who don't believe this specific doctrine or that specific doctrine, would have salvation and be in the kingdom. Stated another way, how does true knowledge of God's truth, or the lack of true knowledge of God's truth, determine a person's salvation? Furthermore, how does a person's motivation and his heart determine a person's salvation? How does a person's love for his neighbor, how does his love for his God, his love for God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, determine a person's salvation? To begin the sermon, please turn with me to Deuteronomy 10, where Yahweh lists his requirements for Israel to follow. The book of Deuteronomy was written right before the Israelites entered into the promised land. But these Israelites were mostly the second generation Israelites that were born after the Exodus. All the people 40 years and younger in this vast multitude were second generation Israelites who weren't at Mount Sinai when their parents received the Ten Commandments and the rest of God's laws, hence the reason for the second giving of the law. That's the meaning of the word Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 10, starting in verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, And now, Israel, what does the eternal your God require of you but to fear Jehovah your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of Jehovah and his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. Please turn with me to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. In answering the question of what our eternal Father required of Israel, he listed these requirements in Micah 6 and in verses 6 through 8. Micah chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before Jehovah and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, 
the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does Jehovah require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In my sermon this afternoon entitled, The Three-Legged Stool, I would like to explore God's judgment on the first fruits and on mankind by exploring three important measured requirements in our spiritual development that Jesus will use in judging us and in judging the rest of humanity. These three measured requirements, these three pillars, tie back to Deuteronomy 10 and Micah 6. The first and I call these three pillars the three-legged stool. The first important measured requirement for salvation in this three-legged stool is the knowledge of God the Father, His Son, and His way. The knowledge of God the Father, of His Son, and of His way. Brethren, we have been so honored and blessed that the Father has called each and every one of us and has opened our minds to understand the knowledge of His truth, the knowledge of His plan of salvation, the knowledge of our part and what we will play in the kingdom of God, the knowledge of His laws, and the knowledge and the better understanding of who He is. Now, this is truly an exciting time in our lives. You can feel it here. Everyone's just buzzing. Everyone's just so excited to be here and to talk. I've never been in a, a feast where the, the subject of the conversation is always on God. You know, God the Father is now opening more and more knowledge about himself and about his relationship with us to his people. Please turn with me to Proverbs 1. Proverbs chapter 1, where we will read a very well-known verse. This verse is repeated by many church organizations, but so few truly understand the, its true meaning and implications in their lives. In Proverbs 1 and verse 7, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The word for fear in this verse is the Hebrew word yira, which can mean fear, but it can also mean reverence. So this verse tells us that our reverence for and our humility before our Heavenly Father is the beginning of knowledge. It's the foundation upon which all of the knowledge that God can instill in us is based. Knowledge and wisdom are given by the Father when we humbly ask for His help. Please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, where again we will read a well-known account where Solomon asked for and received knowledge from God. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, and again we'll start in verse 7. In that night did God appear unto Solomon and, and said unto him, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said unto God, You have shown great mercy unto David my father and have made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Jehovah God, let your promise unto David my father be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude." Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this people, your people, that is so great? And God said to Solomon, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of your enemies, neither have you asked for long life, but you have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself." that you may judge your, my people over whom I have made you king. And then in verse 12, wisdom and knowledge 
is granted unto you. And I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had that have been before you, neither shall there any after you have the like. So our Heavenly Father granted wisdom and knowledge to Solomon because he asked for it. That was what he asked for. And he gave so much wisdom and so much knowledge to Solomon that there's never been anyone since who has had the wisdom and the knowledge of Solomon. Please turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. King David desired to have knowledge from Jehovah. And he prayed that the Lord would teach him knowledge. And we read this in Psalm 119 and verse 64. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 64. The earth, O Jehovah, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt with me with your you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according unto your word. And in verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed your commandments. He earnestly asked God for knowledge. Knowledge about him. Brethren, do we pray each day that God would give us more knowledge about Him? About His nature and about His character, about His laws, and about His majesty and His greatness. The book of Proverbs has much to say about knowledge. In fact, the Hebrew word da'ath appears 39 times in the book of Proverbs. We'll read just a few examples from this book. If you would, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 2. Again, the, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the knowledge that God can impart. Proverbs 2, starting in verse 1. My son, if you will receive my words and hide my commandments with you, so that you incline your ear unto wisdom... And apply your heart to understanding. Yea, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search her as for hidden treasures. Then you shall understand the fear of Jehovah. And find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keeps the paths of judgment and preserves the way of his saints. Then shall you understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom enters into your heart and knowledge is pleasant unto your soul, in verse 11, discretion shall preserve you. Understanding shall keep you. Verse 3 states that we should yearn and cry and cry out for knowledge. That we should seek knowledge as we would silver or gold or precious things or riches. Verse 5 states that we will find knowledge if we ask. Brethren, do we yearn for learning more and more of God's truth and more and more of the knowledge that God can impart? Are we excited to learn more about our Heavenly Father? Please turn with me to Proverbs 15, and we will read a few important verses concerning knowledge. Proverbs 15 and verse 14. The heart of him that has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds feeds on foolishness. A few pages over in Proverbs 18 and verse 15, The heart of the prudent gets knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Please turn with me over to Proverbs 8, where we'll read a phenomenon that we know all too well. Proverbs 8, and in verse 8. 
We read, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understands and right to them that find knowledge. Certain knowledge that we have had imparted to us makes sense, and it doesn't to many other people. And we read this in Proverbs 14 and verse 16. Proverbs 14 and verse 6. Proverbs 14 and verse 6. A scorner seeks wisdom and finds it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understands. Brethren, when we discuss God's truth with friends or family members in the world, the truth is often a mystery and is often very confusing to them when it is so plain to us. Why is that? Why is that? Please turn with me to Matthew 13. Mr. Ralston used this section of Scripture in his sermon a few weeks ago, and I'd like to read it in the New Living Translation, as he did also. Matthew 13, starting in verse 10. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10. His disciples came and asked him, Why do you use parables when you talk to the people? And Jesus replied, You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables, for they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they're not, they don't really listen or understand. I gave a sermon a couple of years ago where I equated the, the knowledge and understanding of God's truth with being cured from colorblindness. You know, a very common colorblindness is deuteranopia, which confuses the colors green and red. That's a very common colorblindness. And someone with duratonopia cannot distinguish red from green. How many of you are familiar with colorblind tests? We've all, most of us, I think, have seen those. One test that I remember is a circle filled with green dots, just a whole bunch of green dots. And in the middle of this circle was a number seven made out of red dots. Well, someone without colorblindness will look at that and immediately see the seven. But someone with colorblindness can look at that and never see anything. All they see is a bunch of dots, same color. And that person could look at that chart for a day, for a month, for a year, all their life. They could look at it upside down. They could look at it any way they could and they will never see that seven. So here we are with that person, and we can't believe that they don't see the seven, and they can't believe that there's something there. You know, the same is true with God's truth. Until God opens our minds and corrects our vision, corrects our spiritual colorblindness, we cannot see the truth. No matter how long we try, no matter how hard we try, we simply will never see that seven. As we read in Matthew 13, if we turn our backs on God's truth, then the Father will allow us to return to our spiritual color blindness. And that truly, brethren, is sad. Please turn with me to Habakkuk 2 where we will read a very important prophecy for all humanity in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14. Just one verse. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. 
You know, the time that Habakkuk is talking about here in verse 14 is represented by the Feast of Tabernacles that we're celebrating right now, where God's truth and God's knowledge and the knowledge of His way will cover the entire earth. And we will have the opportunity with, along with Jesus Christ to teach the nations God's way, to teach them the way of life that God the Father intended from the very beginning that mankind should live. Brethren, are we thankful for the precious knowledge that we understand? Do we thank our Heavenly Father every day for the knowledge that we have, the knowledge that He has specifically and individually allowed us to understand? What a wonderful and deep privilege and honor it is that our Father has done that. But with that privilege, with that honor, comes responsibility. Please turn with me to James 4 and verse 17. James chapter 4 and verse 17. God holds us accountable for what we know. We read that in James 4 and verse 17. Therefore to him that knows to do good, that has the knowledge, and does it not, to him it is a sin. Knowledge brings responsibility, and in the end, knowledge can bring condemnation. In the New Living Translation, James 4 and verse 17 is translated, Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. Jesus had something to say about this. If you turn with me to Luke 12, Luke chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 45. Luke chapter 12 and verse 45. Jesus was saying, But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming and shall begin to beat the manservant, men servants and maids, maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken, and the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he is not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. With knowledge comes responsibility and accountability. Brethren, knowledge of God's truth is crucial for our salvation. Knowledge, though, requires action. Knowledge to know things just to know them is of no use. But knowledge is only one of the three legs of the three-legged stool. Knowledge is definitely not the only yardstick that God uses for salvation. The second important measure requirement for salvation in this three-legged stool is an obedient, contrite heart. An obedient, contrite heart. The world and its society today continues to turn further and further and further away from God. Two characteristics that are not shown much at all in today's society and today's world are obedience and humility. Being good and honest and being humble are ridiculed by the world and are viewed now as weaknesses. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul warned us about the evil characteristics of the world in the end time. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 1. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You know, our Heavenly Father refuses to work with people who are headstrong, boastful, egotistical, proud, and disobedient to His laws and principles. He simply does not work with those people. Sadly, this was the centuries-long history of the relationship between Jehovah and the Israelites. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Jehovah so much desired that the Israelites would obey Him and humbly subject themselves to His rule. But they really never, ever did. And he says something that's very sad in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29. Jehovah said, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. That was his desire. Please turn with me to Isaiah 29, where we read that Israel's relationship with Jehovah was very superficial and very temporary. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. And this is where the world is right now in their relationship with God. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. Isaiah wrote, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So we can do lip service to God all day long. We can do lip service to our Father day in and day out. But where is our heart? Where is our heart with Him? The history of mankind is that ever since the fall of Adam and the Garden of Eden, man has always given lip service to God. Man does not want God's involvement in, his, in their lives unless there's a crisis. Then they just call all the time on, on God. They want God during their crisis. But as soon as the crisis is over, what do they do? They immediately forget Him. They don't need Him anymore. Man has always wanted to do what he's wanted to do, not what God has wanted him to do. God stands in the way of him doing what he wants to do. That's the history of mankind. God the Father refuses to work with an attitude like that. However, Jehovah has chosen a few select faithful servants that have shown the characteristics of an obedient and contrite heart. And one of those men was King David. Please turn with me to Acts 7. Acts chapter 7. You know, after Saul's continual disobedience to the Eternal's instructions, Jehovah decided to choose another king for Israel. Someone who would have a completely different heart than Saul had. And in Acts 7, we are reading about Stephen's defense where he went through a history of all of Israel. And Stephen referenced this particular part from 1 Samuel 13. And we read this in Acts 7 and verse 21. 
Stephen said, And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul the son of Cis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony. And he said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed has God, according to his promise, raised unto, unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So God was looking for a man after his own heart. Please turn with me to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, where we, we will read that Jehovah draws near to those who have an obedient and contrite heart. Psalm 34, and we'll begin, we'll read verse 18. Psalm 34 and verse 18. Jehovah is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save such as be of a contrite spirit. God works with those with whom he can work. And what determines that is what is in our heart. Are we truly seeking Him? Are we wanting Him always? Is He the most important part of our life? Please turn with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66, where Isaiah further identifies the type of men with whom Jehovah is looking to have a relationship and with whom He can fulfill His will. In Isaiah 66, In verse 2, Isaiah writes, For all those things has my hand made, and all those things have been, that have been, says Jehovah, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. Do we tremble at his word? In Psalm 119, we read of David's love for God's law. Here is a man after God's own heart, acknowledging his deep love for the law of Jehovah. We sing these words in hymn 77 in our hymnal. In Psalm 119, and starting in verse 97, it says, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. You are... Through your commandments have made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep your righteous judgments. You know, even unto his old age, King David had a deep desire to obey God. He made so many mistakes when he did everything with his whole heart, and when he sinned, he did it with his whole heart. But he's going to be in the kingdom. Please turn with me to 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29. King David knew that he would not live much longer, that his death was approaching. And he turned the kingdom of Israel over to his son Solomon. And at the investiture ceremony where Solomon was crowned king, King David prayed a very insightful prayer, which gives us a glimpse of his heart and his unwavering desire to please God and to obey Him. In 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 18, I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. 1 Chronicles 28, 29 and verse 18. O Lord, the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make your people always want to obey you. 
See to it that their love for you never changes. Give my son Solomon the wholehearted desire to obey all your commandments, laws, and decrees, and to do everything necessary to build this temple for which I have made these preparations. His prayer is that Solomon would continue to obey and to be humble before his God. Please turn with me to Genesis 22. We read in Genesis 22 that Abraham was tested by God and that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son, what he really viewed as his only his son of promise, in order to be to obey God. We read of God's answer to Abraham's willingness to obey him, no matter the cost, no matter the pain, and no matter the hardship. We read this in Genesis 22 and verse 16. And said, By myself have I sworn, says the Eternal, for because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." What did Abraham do? He obeyed God, no matter the cost, no matter the sacrifice, and no matter the hurt. Abraham obeyed God and showed God his deep conviction and his willingness to do whatever God asked him to do. And as a result, God richly blessed Abraham in his life, not only Abraham, but all of his descendants. The greatest example of a contrite, obedient heart, though, was the life of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. Again, when Jesus was in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what awaited him in just a few hours from then, that he would be mocked cruelly, that he'd have to endure the unbearable pain of being whipped and scourged just short of death, and that he would have to die the slow, agonizing death of crucifixion. He still prayed that his Father's will would be done. And we read this in Luke 22 and verse 41. Luke 22 and verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not, your will, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was human. He didn't want to die. He knew what awaited him. But it wasn't his will that he asked for. It was the will of his Father. Please turn with me to Luke 6. Luke 6. Mr. Springfield talked about this, and we read it in Matthew. We'll read this in Luke 6. Knowledge without obedience is not profitable. Knowledge without obedience is not profitable. What good is knowledge without obedience? Jesus was teaching his disciples and the multitude about the importance of doing through obedience the things that a man learns and knows to be true and right. We read this in Luke 6 and verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. And why call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. Here's a man who has knowledge, and he does what God says. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon the house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and does not, 
The person who has knowledge and does not obey and do what God is telling him to do. He is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Again, knowledge requires action, and action requires obedience and humility. Knowledge without action becomes useless in helping yourself or in helping others. Brethren, if we have knowledge but we don't have a contrite, obedient heart, our Heavenly Father will not be pleased with us. Please turn with me to Zechariah 14. Well, we read another example about this very scenario of having knowledge but not a contrite heart. Zechariah 14 and verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the earth which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso, whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the king, the uh, Yahweh of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So here are people that know to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They're given that knowledge. But they don't have a contrite, obedient heart. I know it, but I'm not going to do it. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith Yahweh will... Smite the heathen that come not up to the, keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's stubborn. That's just plain stubborn. You got the knowledge, but your heart will not let you obey God. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. These disobedient nations in the millennium will know God's truth. It will be available to them. They will know it, but they won't do anything with that knowledge. Because of stubbornness and pride, they will still refuse to obey Jehovah, our Father, and to go to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, brethren, do we have an obedient and contrite heart? Are we pleasing our Heavenly Father? Is that a goal every day, to please our Heavenly Father? Are our words, our actions, and our attitudes pleasing to Him? Are we constantly seeking our own will, what we want? Or are we surrendering more and more each day of our will to our Father? Brethren, having an obedient, contrite heart is crucial for our salvation. But obedience and humility comprise only one of the three legs of that stool. An obedient, contrite heart is not the only yardstick for salvation. Brethren, the third important measure requirement for salvation in that three-legged stool is love. Love. The world today has cheapened the meaning of love. Satan's influence in music and in the culture today is to mean the word to basically mean sex. Being selfless today is not celebrated or applauded in any way by the world. Selfless love is denigrated and actually ridiculed by society. The greatest example of selfless love is found in one of the most powerful and probably the, the most well-known verse in the Bible in John 3.16. We don't, won't even need to turn there, but it reads, For God so loved the world, our Father so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God the Father has loved all of mankind so much and so deeply that He was willing to let His only Son, Jesus the Messiah, to come to this earth as a mortal man, and to die for all of our sins. And Jesus loved mankind so much that he was willing to come and do it 
and to die for us while we were yet sinning. That is selfless love. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. In the second giving of the law before the Israelites entered into the promised land, our Heavenly Father gave a very important requirement and commandment to them. In Deuteronomy 6, in verse 4, it's called the Shema, which in Hebrew means hear. It says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one Yahweh, and you shall love Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The Hebrew word for love is Ahab. A-H-E-B, and it's defined as to love that in which a man delights or which he earnestly desires. It implies ardent and vehement inclination of the mind, at the same time tenderness and fullness of affection, and is used of the unspeakable love and tender mercies of God and covenant with His people. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 11 where Jehovah tells the Israelites that if they love him, that he would bless them. In Deuteronomy 11, in verse 13, And it shall come to pass, if you will hearken diligently unto your, to my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the eternal your God, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your corn and your wine and your oil. You know, besides a love for God, there is also the need to show love for one another. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 10, where Jehovah commands that the Israelites love one another and the less fortunate. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17, just one page back, For the eternal God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regards not persons nor takes reward. He does execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger in giving him food and raiment. And then there's a commandment here. Love you the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. It's telling... God is telling people to love one another, love the less fortunate, show mercy and compassion on them. This is the exact same concept of the golden rule that we read about in Matthew 7, where Jesus Christ taught in verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever you would do that man should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The entirety of Exodus 20 through Exodus 23 are the laws showing how Israel was to show love to God and how they were to show love to each other. Please turn with me to Mark 12. Well, we will read that Jesus reiterated these two principles of love. Love for our Heavenly Father and love for one another when answering questions being asked by the scribes. And Jesus quotes directly from Deuteronomy 6. We read this, Mark 12 and verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And verse 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none other commandment greater than these. You know, however, Jesus also magnifies and deepens the meaning of loving one another in a way totally foreign to the natural human nature and the natural human mind. Please turn with me to Luke 6. Jesus commanded us to do something that is impossible to do without God's Holy Spirit and without God's guidance. It is totally contrary to human nature. And it's totally contrary to the world. The world does not understand this. 
they laugh at this. And again, Mr. Springfield talked about this. In Luke 6 and verse 27, Luke 6 and verse 27, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. And he said of a child, And unto him that smites you on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that takes away your cloak, forbid not to take your cloak also. Give to every man that ask of you. And to him that takes away your goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, you do to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thanks do you have? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thanks do you have? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them who, to whom you hope to receive, what thanks do you have? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the, king, the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. But you therefore, be you therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Brethren, do we show this type of love for others in our actions, in our words? in our attitudes, and in our motivations? Are we allowing the Father and His Son to fill our hearts and our minds with their love in order to truly achieve this level of love for others? You know, in the New Testament, the word love is translated from two of three main Greek words for love. The first is eros, which is sexual or erotic love, and this word actually doesn't appear in the New Testament. But the other two we're very familiar with. One is Philadelphia, which means brotherly love, and the other is agape, agape, which is the godly love or unselfish love. The Greek word agape is equivalent to the Hebrew word acheb. The Greek word is utilized significantly throughout the New Testament. The verb form of this Greek word agape is used for God's love for mankind in John 3, 16. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13, where the Apostle Paul wrote about the extreme importance of this type of agape love. The King James Version of the Bible often translates this Greek word agape as charity. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, this puts where the importance of love is in this stool, this three-legged stool. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains, and I don't have charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all the goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and I have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when, we, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I even know, I know even as I also am known. In verse 13, And now abides faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. 
So, brethren, we can have all knowledge. We can have all, know all mysteries that God has opened our minds to. But if we don't have love, it serves no purpose. And it becomes useless. It actually would become prideful. Please turn with me to John 13. John chapter 13. This type of agape love is so important that Jesus gave a new commandment to us concerning its use in our lives. In John 13 and verse 34, John 13 and verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. This command from Jesus was repeated in this discourse to his disciples during the Passover service in John 15 and verses 12 and 17. We read this every year at Passover. This command is so important in the life of a Christian. Brethren, love in Hebrew and in Greek are action verbs. They're, to love someone, to show godly love, you have to do something. It's not an idle word. Love requires action. Are we showing and are we reflecting God's love in our relationship with Him? and with the relationships we have with one another. Are we growing in love each and every day? Day by day, are we growing in that special type of love? Love comprises a crucial leg of the three-legged stool. But again, love is only one part of those three requirements for salvation. Brethren, turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We are being judged right now in our lifetime. We are the first fruits, and judgment is upon us now. Jesus Christ will be our judge, and he will be the world's judge in the future. And we read about this in John 5 and verse 21. John chapter 5 and verse 21. Jesus said, For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom He will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent Him. So, brethren, all judgment is given by the Father to Jesus Christ. Why? Why would the Father give all judgment to Jesus? Please turn with me to Hebrews 4, where we'll read the answer. Hebrews 4. God the Father will commit all judgment of mankind to Jesus Christ for a specific reason. In Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have such a high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Brethren, Jesus Christ will judge all of mankind because he, w- he Himself was tempted in all points during His physical life. And He has experienced everything, everything that we are going through. Brethren, it is not for us to judge any other person's salvation. God the Father even refrains from judging the spiritual and eternal salvation of each person in the history of humanity. 
He has committed that judgment to his son. And it seems like we're always so busy wondering about and seeing, well, are they saved? Are they not saved? It is Jesus Christ who will determine that. And there are three basic pillars of judgment. The three-legged stool of knowledge, of of an obedient, contrite heart, and love. Only Jesus knows what minimum threshold of each of those three pillars of those legs of the stool that we'll need to have in order to enter his kingdom. Only he knows. But it takes a combination of all three. All, and all three require action. Again, like we read in 1 Corinthians 13, we can have all the understanding and all of the knowledge that God could give to us. And if we don't have love for God the Father and for Jesus, if we don't have love for one another and for our fellow man, we are nothing, and we will not enter God's kingdom. Also, if we're very loving people, if we show hospitality, generosity, warmth, friendliness, compassion to everyone we meet, but we don't know the truth at all, we will not enter the kingdom of God. That is why the most loving and wonderful Buddhist or Hindu or Muslim or even some Christians, many Christians who don't know God's way, will not enter the kingdom of God until the Father and Christ work with them. And again, if we have knowledge, but we don't have a contrite, obedient heart, we will not be in the kingdom. In fact, as we read earlier in James 4 and in Luke 12, if we have knowledge and we refuse to obey, we will reap even more condemnation on ourselves. Because we did know, we did have that knowledge, and we did not do God's will with what we knew. We all need these three pillars of judgment in our physical and our spiritual lives. Brethren, God the Father has entrusted us with His precious truth. But knowing His truth requires action on our part. We must be growing in love for Him and for one another. And we must become more and more obedient and humble before our Father so that He and His Son can mold and shape us to reflect their righteousness and their spiritual qualities more and more in in our lives until that day in the future when we will hear those precious words, Well done, you faithful, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of your Lord.